Uh, hello, welcome to uh, the final week of the NADP conference. My name's Caroline Huntley. I'm the um, new, brand new chair of NADP. I've been with NADP on the board for a couple of years and um, my first day of chair was um, basically the end of last week. So um, <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, everybody. There is a video that uh, says more about me if you're interested in finding out. It's a sort of goodbye from Brian, who was the chair, and a uh, hello from me on the main NADP website. Uh, so thank you to Captioned, who sponsored us for and um, by providing captions for every week of the conference for the webinars that we've had. And uh, the link for captions is in the chat box. Thank you for our to our headline sponsors, Microlink. Uh, Brain in Hand and Lexable and uh, all our other sponsors as well and um, keeping this conference free for, for everybody who's joined us and don't forget to join the goodie bags page and uh, take advantage of all the competitions, good services that are sponsored and I believe there's a, a, free, a, a an opportunity to get a cream tea as well so it sounds very exciting. Thank you very much to all our panellists who've generously donated their time and expertise and um, all the thought provoking presentations that we've had over the five weeks and uh, a special thanks to everybody who's hosted each week of um, the conference this year. Uh, so we've got CP CPD points available for joining this and Joe um, at the office will be putting up a feedback form as well um, on the main website. So the um, CPD points are a maximum of 12 half hours so please complete the form um, to, to get your points and they'll be uh, sent out as an official certificate with your points in it. So the major news for today is that the uh, balloon race has finished, finished at noon today. And um, the winner, I'm pleased to announce, is Millie Manda uh, from the University of Brighton, who has won the balloon race this year. So congratulations to you. Um, so, and finally, just before I uh, hand over to Paddy, who's going to be chairing today's panel uh, on CPD and uh, workplace training and so on, um, I would like to announce the awards this year. NADP have annual awards, and uh, these are awarded um, uh, at the conference each year, and this being the final week of the conference, um, I'm going to let you know who got the awards. So the Deb Viney Award, um, and this is for a practitioner who has uh, given uh, much to the sector in terms of inclusion and disability um, support, etc. And the winner this year is Harriet Cannon. And the Outstanding Achievement Award for this year. It, it will be um, awarded to Claire Ozel um, um, from Turkey, who I believe is also retiring from her post, uh, if not, hasn't already, will be soon. And this year, we also have a Teams Award for the first time, and this year, and this time it has been won by University of the West of England. So congratulations to everybody who's um, achieved awards this year and thank you to every, everybody who nominated someone um, and got involved and to the awards panel who uh, um, have you know, put their heads together and come up with the final list and the video relating to the awards uh, will also be on our main NADP web page if not now very shortly indeed. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Paddy Turner now and um, uh, take it from here Paddy you're going to talk about CPD. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I hope I'm not going to do much talking about CPD. I've got a fabulous um, array of panel members to share the conversation with. Um, I, I, it's one of those areas that is so, so important. Everyone knows, everyone recognises how uh, central CPD is to um, professions. All professionals have to engage in it and uh, demonstrate that they do. Um, and yet I, I, I think increasingly in an anecdotal sort of way, we've been hearing more and more stories about how um, how CPD opportunities seem to be being cut, particularly in, in difficult times. And so it just seemed, uh, you know, these are particularly difficult times now. It seemed like an apposite uh, point to just get some views from different people around the sector. So this is a, a wonderful panel that we have uh, around us, all of whom come from different areas with different jobs and different roles within the sector and ranges of experience. And uh, people who have told me that they promised me faithfully that they're able to speak for at least five minutes without stopping. Um, no, obviously that's okay. fib. <laughs> but I know that they're uh, lovely, friendly, talkable people. And I'm going to ask them now just to introduce themselves uh, just very, very briefly. Give us a, a, a sort of brief lowdown. Um, but uh, I also just want to explain to all of you that this is a very uh, unstructured session. Um, uh, the delegates of the, the, sorry, the panel members have been given some questions that uh, I may or may not ask, uh, very loose questions just to keep the conversation flowing. Um, but I'm not going to ask a question in, in question time uh, sort of style, just go around the, every single member of the panel. It's going to be very much a contribute as we go. We might go off down different, different directions and we'll be obviously taking note of the sorts of things that you, uh, questions or comments that you make in the chat and Helen will be raising those on uh, the odd occasion. So, so you've got the opportunity to contribute as well. Uh, there'll be another Slido uh, coming up a bit later for you to give your comments uh, and thoughts about different aspects. So without further ado, um, just in Zoom honored fashion, I'm gonna ask because of the way things are placed on the screen, Amy to uh, introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Lowe from AbilityNet. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with us, we're a charity and we use technology to remove barriers to participation for disabled people at home, at work and in education. Um, and we do this via a range of free and paid for services, uh, some that are aimed at individuals to provision them with technology training and strategies for success, but we also work with organisations helping them evaluate and confirm whether their digital platforms and their internal and customer or student facing processes are designed and developed with accessibility and inclusion in mind. Um, and just before we start, I'd just like to say how much we value being members of NADP. Uh, both the central team and, and, and the board and how active and participative they are, but the community of practice as well is just really beneficial for us. Um, and it's great to be here today with such a fabulous panel and keen to discuss these interesting topics. Thanks, Amy. Um, your check will be uh, in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You can see why we chose Amy to come on to the panel, can't you? Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Alison, please. Hi. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Alison Phillips, and I'm a disability advisor working at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, I've been a disability advisor for about 14 years in two other institutions as well in London. So I feel like I know how it works in different places because um, it can vary um, across different higher education institutions. So mainly what I do is see students, try and support them, advise them, also advise staff a lot as well, know quite a lot about DSA. Um, I've also been quite involved in the NADP accreditation process, which is kind of CPD related, um, which we'll probably talk about a bit today as well. That's me in a nutshell. 
and a beautiful nutshell it is too. Thanks, <laughs> Alison. Uh, Chris. Hi, um, I'm Christine Warrell. I work at Cardiff University. Um, I've been working in disability services in uh, higher education since 2000. Started off in a small specialist institution and Cardiff has 33,000 students, so now working in a large organisation. Um, as the head of the service, our services have the disability advisors, we have a DSA assessment centre, we offer non-medical help services, so it's a broad range of services. Um, I've also been involved in NADP, I was on the board for a number of years, the last couple of years, been an advisor representing all things Wales slash Welsh. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and uh, I, did you notice how I refrained from my really bad cod Welsh accent? I thought I thought that was quite impressive. Um, but um, let, hopefully I won't resort to that at all today. Uh, Nikki, you happen to be next on the screen. Hello, I'm Nicola Martin. I've been involved in NADP since it started and I, I've been the chair and the vice chair and on the editorial board of the journal and I'm still involved with the boards and probably will be forever, I suppose, in one capacity or another. Um, I've headed up various disability services and been an access centre manager and an assessor and so on. And now I've, I've sort of made that jump from um, working in professional services to working in an academic role. So I'm professor of um, social justice and inclusive education at London South Bank University. And in terms of CPD, I've been involved in lots of CPD stuff within and beyond NADP. So I lead on the autism mental training and I'm CPD standards office approved for any sort of autism training. And then within my day job, I, I've got, for example, postgraduate certificate, MA, doctorate, all related to inclusive education that quite a few of our colleagues have been part of or are about to join. So I do it in both capacities, really. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. And last but absolutely not least, uh, Fiona. <laughs> Hello. So I've worked in um, higher education in disability services for around 12 years. Um, before that, I was um, a freelance art practitioner. So I used to go and work with um, disabled people in, in schools and in occupational therapy units in hospitals and things like that. Um, I started life in in um, in university um, as a note taker. I've since worked at a, um, a couple of, of universities um, across the Midlands region and Shropshire and now I'm at University of Wolverhampton. Um, I'm a specialist tutor, that's my title at the moment. Um, I also work on our um, race equality charter and last but not least, not least I'm a, a, a director of the National Association of Disability Practitioners, so there you have it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Fiona. And um, and I suppose I should just briefly say a few words about myself as well. So um, I work at Sheffield Hallam. Uh, so I'm a colleague of Alison's, although we're in completely separate teams. Um, I've been at Sheffield Hallam since 98, uh, working across disabled student support for many, many years, and then shifting into an academic education development role, which is where I sit now with a brief around uh, inclusion and diversity and particularly around supporting staff applying for um, their accreditation from Advanced HE as fellows of the HEA as it used to be known. So I do a lot of professional development work within that. Um, I can trump Nikki because I've been uh, involved with NADP since before it started, actually. True. <laughs> I was in the working group, but then I, th but then I, I left again and didn't come in until, until Nikki bent, twisted my arm and made me start in 2005. So, um, and, and, and ADP is a good place to start really, because, you know, if, 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 we're, if it was started for any reason at all, it was to provide support and development for people across the whole sector. And that remains our one of, you know, if not our key aim, at least extremely close to our, our main purpose as, as an organisation. So, um, yes, CPD, professional development is absolutely at the heart. And I, before um, we go on to any more kind of detailed questions, I'd just like to 
get a few ideas from from the panel you know just so we're all talking about the same thing what do we think cpd actually is i mean we talk about it as a as a term cpd but what what does it cover for for you any anyone want to chip in with a with a thought on that hands up and i'll shout your name nobody wants to start i've got my hand oh. up Fiona's got oh, her hand yeah, up. I've got my hand. I can't sit still for very long, so I thought I'd, I'd start the ball rolling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Amy actually um, said something which was really profound, which was it's lovely to be part of this community of practice. And actually, I thought that was probably a nice thing to start with because I think earlier on in my career, um, particularly, um, there just seems to be a bit of a a link to pay scales when it comes to CPD. When I was a, a note taker, I wasn't given very many, I think it's fair to say, CPD opportunities really. I was given a lot of training at the start of my job and, and I'm very grateful to, to my institution for that. But after that point, the CPD opportunities seemed to dry up a little bit for me in terms of um, compared with, with other professionals who were, who were higher at the pay scale. Um, and I always thought of CPD as being courses that you booked on that cost money that you paid for. And over time, actually, I've realised that the things that I'm learning are actually, it's far more than that. So the community of practice and the professional networks have, have been um, such a source of growth and knowledge for me. Um, and actually, it's it's a terrible cliche, but, it, you know, life isn't just about what you know, it's about who you know. For me, it's been really helpful um, because I'm neurodiverse myself as a dyspraxic person, just having um, colleagues around me that help me to join the dots. So I've, I've got lots of little separate pots of knowledge, if you like, um, but I don't always... Um, realize straight away how those things might connect um but actually having people around me has helped me to make some of those connections and i think the community of practice element of cpd has just become so important thank you fiona yeah yeah any other comments um i guess I'm, oh sorry nicola you, you no, so i just can't i haven't got the icon to put my hand i haven't up. either oh, yeah, I have it here, isn't it's, it down the bottom yeah yeah but um, I haven't got it no carry on I found it first <laughs> uh, I guess I was just gonna say it's in its in its broadest sense CPD is just all around us isn't it and more and more it's just uh that there's more and more choice I mean it, it it's it, you know it's really about acquiring and maintaining a skill set in your chosen profession but actually the, the means to tap into that has just become you know it's just become broader and broader and what Fiona was saying about this sense of which training courses shall I book and pay for this year to tick off CPD has evolved with this sort of you know the the knowledge um, explosion through online and so on into being much more on the job bite-sized sharing and it's almost about curating and sharing within communities of practice um you know the the information of, and i think sometimes there's too much and it's trying to channel it down into what can you um what can you put your trust in and where do you want to have those discussions and I think that's where the communities of practice really do um, come into their own. Nikki. Yeah sorry I haven't got the icon to put my hand up today. No, I it's a bit random isn't it? Anyway well, I was absolutely agreeing with Amy but I want to pick up particularly on Fiona's point about the pay scales and the roles and the opportunities for CPD and I feel really strongly that professional services and academic colleagues work together with students at the heart of the student experience and if we are developing best practice in the student experience then professional services colleagues need equal access to CPD alongside academics and I think that doesn't happen and in a lot of institutions I think that doesn't happen. I also think professional services colleagues are rarely round the table when it comes to researching the student experience and I think that is problematic and I think that relates to um, 
CPD one-off events, you know, and, and accredited learning and, you know, things like postgraduate certificates and diplomas and doctorates and everything else, academics will get fee waiver, professional services colleagues won't. And I think there's a big equity issue here that we need to address personally. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, traditionally, my understanding of CPD was, you know, booking on a conference and going away and it costing money. But over the years, I think it's developed a lot. And what I find more useful is kind of the more informal things that isn't yeah. often considered CPD. And in fact, you might, <laughs> you might not agree with me, but things like... Um, I don't know if anybody's seen recently on Radio 3, there's been My Deaf World this, it's, um, under the essay. And there's been five different stories of deaf people from the deaf community talking about their experiences. And I just think it's really interesting and it's informative and it's not HE specific or higher education specific, but it's very useful to think this is where our students will be coming from. And one of my colleagues actually set up a like an informal study group that members of the disabled student support team could join it was you know free to them if they wanted to and we could bring along things so if we'd watched um a tv program that had something interesting about disability or there'd been a, a news article and we could send a link to that and then we would discuss it and so that seems like a little bit more informal but still really mm. useful and a lot of it's done outside of work time actually but we should be you know allowed to do it in the work sphere Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, finding space for CPD seems to be um, a question. I mean, f f I know that uh, when people, even even people doing uh, academics, doing fellowship, um, and they and, and they come to me at the start saying, you know, it's in it's in my PDR review, or my appraisal. I'm gonna, I'm, I've got to do it this year, and then every time anything. Uh, happen workloads step in and suddenly it becomes deprioritized do you think do you feel that um that cpd tends to get quite easily and quickly deprioritized chris you had your you were waving yeah. at me <laughs> yeah sorry paddy I, I i wanted to pick up on something that was said previously to, to that if that's okay um i was listening to you know particularly what fiona and, and amy were saying about um those opportunities that are sort of everywhere and, and in being in the community and I think there's something about as a practitioner is putting yourself into that learning mode when yeah. you're exposed so it doesn't it be it's not just information it's it is learning and and I think that's something that it's very easy to feel as though you're exposed to a lot of CPD if you if you are absorbing new information but there's something a bit more active for it to sort of um i think address that kind of professional development so so that it sticks and so that you learn from it rather than you just kind of act on that information once and then it doesn't kind of get built into what what you're doing and how you approach things so that's kind of a the point i was making um yeah. in answer to your your question about whether it gets deprioritized i think yes and i think it's time as well as resource yeah. The reason it gets deprioritized is just it, yes, it's it's something that gets looked at when budgets get tight, but it's also when people are busy. Yes. Oh, yes. Can I comment yeah. on those CPD conversations? Because I think sometimes meetings can be absolutely dominated by everybody getting together and one person telling them a load of information, which then I think negates the whole opportunity for the meeting to be a learning context where people can actually knock around some ideas, do some critical thinking, do some strategic planning together. And I think that CPD within the context of meetings that, that inform a strategy for a department or whatever it is, they're really important and they are very, very often missed if the person who chairs the meetings thinks that their role it's just to tell everybody a load of information and what they've got to do and everybody else's role is to go away and do that thing they've been told to do. That sort of negates the opportunity for the critical thinking and the professional development and everything else. And I think a really good topic for CPD is how to conduct a meeting that actually gets people to engage their brains. I think that'd be really useful. I think it's true. And I think that's also, you know, linking to what Chris was saying uh, about um, making making sure that 
basically translating whatever the context is that you are in into a yeah. learning event and Definitely. having that learning head on is also partly a habit. And, you know, what you're talking about, Nikki, is, you know, you tend, if, if you're not careful, the habit becomes, we'll receive a load of information, we'll write down the bits that we know we have to do, we'll go away and we'll do it. And the learning doesn't take place at all because, it, and that becomes a habit then. Yeah. And I definitely noticed that in contexts around accreditation submissions, where what we get is, you know, this is what I was told to do and I've, I've done it. Uh, as, as an example of CPD rather than an example of attending something, how you've learned something and changed your practice as a result of that. Um, yeah, interesting. So, so where does the, uh, so that, that's a question around critical analysis really, isn't it? Of whatever it is you're engaged in. Is there any, any uh, is that the, everyone's experience? Yeah. What do you think? Um, how do you think critical analysis relates to um, something like uh, organizational efficiency and, you know, efficiency of process? Uh, Amy and then Nikki. Um, I was just going to say taking a critical analysis approach is just so important to allow innovation to flourish within an organization and going back to what Nikki was saying about having a very sort of top down um off you go I know what you need to do and off you go and do it is is uh, you know the, the exact opposite of of critical thinking and creating a safe space in meetings and 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 everywhere in the workplace for the, the softer voices and the louder voices to be heard and for people to come at a challenge saying, this could be a new challenge that none of us have encountered before. And also, I was having a chat with, uh, with a colleague about this before the panel and saying how there's, there's so, our sector is so fast moving and things are changing all the time. So you've got you know the science and and uh, and what whatever's been researched and the latest updates around disability you've got cultural change and how that's moving along and then you've got technology and and the bewildering amount of new technologies that are hitting us every day and then everyone needs to keep on top of all those advances and do the day job so critical thinking is absolutely imperative for for efficiency because if you if you look back and reflect on what we've done before for decision making you you're just going to fall behind yeah yeah, yeah. Well, nikki you you yeah. and, then, and then fiona sorry i yeah. missed your raised hand fiona yeah just picking up on that point i think the the whole thing um uh, Amy, you just mentioned reflecting on what you've done before. I think the reflecting thing is incredibly important because I think if we've got a particular action we're going to engage with, like, for example, making the admissions process um, equitable, equality impact, making it make sense, etc. So I think with that process or any process, you set objectives which are ideally and really should be informed by the experiences of the students. And there's some way the students come to the party to be involved in that. And then you enact whatever it is you're trying out, but then you evaluate it in a very critical but honest way. So there's not a blame culture. So you don't say, well, that went wrong because the admissions team did this. You actually really look at it and then you work out how it's gonna be different next year. And then you revisit that before you start the admissions again so it's this whole it's it's just like almost like an action research process isn't it and I think the CPD element of that is that everybody is involved in the critical thinking if the culture is such that we all have agreed objectives and what we're working on the direction we're going and we've all agreed that we've got equal status in commenting on you know what's wrong with it what's right with it how it could be changed and also definitely including students in that but it has to be this ongoing cycle all the time. And there's a diagram that I've seen. It's a, it's a circle with all these arrows pointing in different directions on the inside of the circle. 
and then another circle with all the actions going in the same direction with an arrow, the, the arrows going in the same direction with an arrow pointing outwards. And one which is chaos is the frustrated organisation <laughs> and the other one is the purposeful organisation or something. And I just think CPD needs to include multidisciplinary teams as well as students because every action has a reaction and we don't necessarily understand all the component parts of the university. So if we all stay in our bubble, we'll just do our own thing, but we don't. We have to see it within a broader context. Sorry, I've gone on a bit there. No, no, really interesting. Fiona, you had your hand up earlier. Was it in relation? I actually, yeah, I actually think that Nikki's probably um, said, said a lot of the things that I was thinking really about, you know, the importance of whole institution approaches to CPD. Um, so I think that critical lens is really important because um, when you're working in equality and diversity and inclusion, you've got power imbalances everywhere. And even when you haven't got power imbalances, you've got perceived power imbalances. So even if we're trying to empower our students and we're, we're, we're trying to approach them in a partnership way and co-create um, an inclusive environment for them there's still often a perceived power imbalance so I think I think that critical lens is just so important and Nikki's already touched on you know the the, um, the the big gap if you like the great divide between academia and professional services and I'm a little bit like you Paddy I've got I've got um, a foot in both camps because I'm a visiting lecturer as well as my um, main role in, in disability services and um, you know I think I think that these power imbalances are everywhere but this critical lens is just so important talking to different people involving different people I'm trying to for example um, get accommodation services and our security staff involved in autism training because actually when things go wrong for some of my students they're probably the first people that they're going to see not the yeah. people in disability and inclusion services uh, okay so uh, you know we're talking at in great depth about you know how different different ways in which we can um approach cpd different different reasons why it's so critical and important and and, and i think we're all agreed of on the importance of cpd why do you think um it's not prioritized as much as it might be why do you think that although we have an appraisal system Across both, whether you know both divide, if you want to call it a divide between academic and professional services, but you know that they, they, they exist in both both halves of the equation. And um, what, what? Why do you think we don't have more CPD on a regular basis? Why do you think it gets deprioritized? I have a horrible feel. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put my hand up. But I have a horrible feeling that some of it is to do with lack of data and metrics around the effectiveness of it. And I know that that sounds like um, a terrible thing to say, but in, you know, in my institution, you want to do something, you have to you have to show the impact it's going to make. Um, and I don't think we're particularly unusual in in that sense. And really, if you take that approach, then you're sort of waiting for, for example, awarding gaps to show themselves before you address things. So you, you're almost waiting for for problems before you address them and CPD is obviously um, you know a way of, of, of helping people to teach and learn more effectively. Um, I, I, I do think that there's, there's an issue there around data and metrics and an, an over obsession with it almost. Maybe that's unfair but yeah. Paddy I think an, another, it, another reason I think the, it's more the traditional CPD that might be sort of the issue, the sort of attending the training type. Um, you know, going back to what Nikki was saying about being in professional services, I think there's a danger that culturally it's seen as professional service staff needs are met by the staff training programme. And anyone who's at a specialist service within professional services sort of falls in that gap. So you have your sort of your staff training program that looks at you know management stuff and kind of you know um, equality diversity in a, in a very broad sense you have that sort of core staff training program um, but I think it, I think it's the nature of what we do is organizationally we're put into professional services but actually we're specialists within um, that structure and so often the off the offer from the 
uh, staff program won't be sufficient for your specialist needs. So I think it's that bit of CPD rather than the, because in some ways I think we are within student service generally, we do have a lot of, of, of communities of practitioners, um, be it um, through the Amoshi, the sort of wider student services, NADP obviously, um, there's ADSHI, the, the, there are communities and, and I think that sort of more informal CPD, we're probably quite lucky. Um, it's more the formal, the training, the time out, the costs, that, that those sorts of ones that potentially are seen differently. Yeah, uh, Alison, thank, thanks, Chris. Alison, oh, yes. So I was just going to say that was exactly my experience because I worked at a university for quite a few years and I found that I just exhausted all of the, um, the university provided CPD because it was just the same rollout every year. So then I had kind of a bit of a dip because every year at my review, it would be like, well, I've done all the courses and you'd be encouraged to do the university ones because they were free and you know, there wasn't the travel time and such. So then if you wanted to do CPD, it was a bit more down to, um, you, you had to go out and look for it more. So it depended how kind of involved you were in groups and, and mixing with other people. And it's what we've said before, when you're really, really busy and you can hardly keep up with the, you know, the day job as it were, which seems to be prioritized, you just don't have the chance or the time often to find that. But I think it was mentioned before people were talking about um, can you have support groups when you get to know people and you and networks that you can develop informally. That often helps if you know somebody and they've done a course and you might just chat with them and they'll recommend it. But it really, really varies and depends on the individual and how proactive you feel you can be yourself. And also the time, time is a massive factor. Paddy, can I make a, just another observation is I think it, sure. what's been interesting is um, with the assessment centre, obviously assessors have had the audit requirement when DSA QAG were, were in place to, to undertake a certain amount of CPD. Um, and then with the non-medical help um, uh, audit requirements, the framework, again, there was a uh, something around having a certain number of hours of CPD. And it's it's interesting that um, disability advisors for, you know, for want of a, a term, they haven't had that kind of audit. Uh, they haven't had that push hasn't been there. So I certainly, you know, noticed for me, it was quite odd having certain sections of the service where actually some, I, I could say, I have, to, I have to send them on this. They have to do this because it's an audit requirement. But actually, I couldn't use that stick with every person. Obviously, we worked around that. But you know what I mean? It's 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 kind of it was quite interesting to see that that difference. And and actually, it was quite an easy stick to use to justify a type of CPD. Right. Yes. 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 A, a big role for technology as well that we're starting to see emerging in creating really useful go-to places for information and CPD. Um, if I think about the um, the, the sort of uh, collaborative work that's gone on around preparing for the public sector regulations for digital accessibility, there were immediately some GISC lists that kind of uh, came about where people were asking each other for advice on digital accessibility topics um, and I know I, I often see Fiona popping up on, on those um, uh, but also then JISC have built a whole team site that is um, devoted to the topic and there are channels for different subjects things like PDFs the joyous topic of PDFs and then something around video and captions and all that kind of stuff. And I think um, the future is not going to be, as Christine was saying, going along to a training, sitting and nodding sagely, writing down a few things and then going back to kind of work the way you always have. It's about finding some new information, thinking so what does that mean for my development and my practice and how I'm going to operate 
uh, differently, but also knowing that there's somewhere you can go back and put your hand on that very quickly. And I think universities have a real opportunity to create that sort of bite-sized reference guide style um, information, which is so much easier to update as well if it's done in small slices of content. Um, my colleague Adam creates these things called 25 and 5, where it goes in deep on a topic, 25 minutes content, five minutes chat, but people can then go back to it. And I think that's really the key thing as well. We're all so used to now Googling everything, immediately forgetting it, but knowing we can Google it again. And I think knowledge, you know, you can only hold so much up here. Um, so having that information at your fingertips, particularly for roles, frontline roles, um, uh, like, like Alison's, where you're going to have lots of people coming to you with different conditions and impairments, and to keep it all up here is, is impossible, isn't it, Alison? So you yeah. need to have those trusted places to go to tap into the latest and greatest information. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, at the beginning of um, lockdown, obviously, there was this mad rush for you know, development of all sorts. Help me, please. <laughs> at the same time, there was a whole group of people who probably for years have been pushing their, their training, their, their knowledge, their awareness of, of important and wonderful things uh, against a sort of very resistant workforce, suddenly going, yes, we've got all these people coming for us. And the next thing you knew, I, f I found anyway, there was just so much it was really, really difficult to um, to know which direction to go, and I and I could see academic staff who were eager to find out what they needed to do in order to be able to deliver their teaching or whatever it might be, and uh, just didn't know in which direction to turn because there was so much information. Um, I wonder how much, you know, how much support can be given to people in terms of how to manage their own CPD. Mm. You know, we talked about critical thinking and, and having that critical analysis approach to whatever it is that you're engaged in that helps you actually move forward and develop yourself. But also just how much time do we spend with, with colleagues or with our managers, actually not just talking about what's important, but but how are we going to go about it and any strategies for doing it? Have you ever come across that kind of thing? Uh, Fiona. I was really lucky actually. Um, a former, a former head of, former head of service, um, former disability services manager is doing um, a mentoring qualification, a mentoring and coaching qualification. And so I have benefited from her doing that course because I've been her guinea pig. And actually, that's one of the reasons I'm sat here now with you guys, because um, I think because I'm dyspraxic, everything seems important. Um, so I got to a point where I was being a bit of a CPD glutton. So I was, <laughs> I was gorging myself on any free opportunity going, which is great, but also getting tired because I was I was mostly doing it a bit like Alice, Alison said, you know, evenings, weekends, lunch times in, in my own time and, and just getting very tired and, and not necessarily having time to cascade that information. And, and there was a realisation, I think, for me that that actually the way I was going about it wasn't perhaps quite right. That realisation interestingly came about when I was doing my um, senior fellowship of the HEA. Um, a part of that that process, as you'll you'll no doubt be very familiar, is that you have to come up with a, a CPD review and plan. And I started to think about, you know, actually I'm doing all these diverse things, but maybe I need to be a bit more structured in my approach. Maybe I need to, you know, pick some things, develop them well before I move out into lots of different things um and i have to say that that having a mentor has really helped me because um it's not just about as i say it's not just about the opportunities it's about how you use them 
and quite often like my interests are often around inclusive curriculum design and universal design for learning and how disability services can start to work with faculty more um, and bridging that great divide and and this particular person has been so instrumental in just helping me build connections with people and helping me start to work in a more strategic way if that makes sense and I, I just wish more people had an opportunity like that because it, it has made a massive difference to me. Nikki. Oh, I think, me. oh I had hand up. that's all right Nikki you go first. Okay. Oh, okay I think what Fiona says about um, evaluating your CPD with with somebody else enabling you to you know, plan your CPD and evaluate it is really important. But I also think that needs to be embedded structurally. We've got appraisals and everything else. But I think they are tools which are not used effectively because, you know, they become rather tick box exercises. And I think using those structures more effectively and having a culture within the institution where CPD is really thought through in that way is really important but one of the things that's really missing in the in the, there's a lot of literature about CPD and its effectiveness and one of the research findings out of that is it's evaluated straight afterwards and you tick a box and all oh, the cakes were very nice I had the chocolate biscuit <laughs> but actually evaluating it in terms of impact on your practice has to be longitudinal so you did CPD three months ago and then you reflect on how you embedded it into your practice and how it changed what you were doing. And also that CPD needs to be, to an extent, bespoke to your context. So if we all go along and have the data protection talk and go click, 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 click all the way through it, and at appraisal we say we've done, we've done data protection, wow. That's probably not impacted on your brain and on your critical thinking or anything at all, because it's just something you think, oh, I've got to do that now. So it's, it's making it relevant and making you reflect back on it after a period of time has passed is the short answer that I'm trying to come up with. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. Amy? Yeah, it's a similar point, really, the fact that um, it's about forward planning and then reflecting. And I mean, at AbilityNet, we're only about 65 people, I guess. So it's easier for us to, to manage this. And we tend to look at, do a, an organisational plan for CPD. What do we all need to know? And, you know, looking critically at the organisation, where are the gaps and make sure that we plug those. Then on a team level, there's a collaborative approach to defining what are we going to look at in CPD for the next quarter and then down at the, the individual level and, and then we can reflect back and see what's been good and what's worked at, at, and what comes next. And I think using some of the time to plan properly and reflect properly is going to be better as as uh, Fiona says and you were mentioning Paddy there's so much out there I could fill my entire working week with relevant poignant topics and it would probably all be really brilliant quality but obviously I couldn't digest and implement all of that so it, it is being able to pick and choose uh, mindfully what's going to make the biggest difference and what's what's the priority now yeah I, I mean I think that's true I think in my experience just talking talking to people and also my own experience of myself is you know we work in a in an arena where quite rightly the student is um you know king queen is pri primary um in the sense that um, you know, we're, we're absolutely desperate to make sure that the service we provide to them is is excellent. And um, we're so pushed for time. We're always, behind, you know, behind the curve. And yet somehow CPD is perceived or feels personal and sort of for us and selfish almost. And therefore, you know, no, I can't do the CPD because I have to make sure I meet the needs of students. That balance is really difficult. It's a bit like the old, um, you know, put put the put the oxygen mask on your face um, before you put it on your child's because without you, you can't do it. And and we we can't provide that excellent service to students in the long run unless we are, as as you were saying earlier, 
you know, learning and developing and moving with the times because we are in, I mean, if the last year has told us anything, we're in uh, an environment that changes rapidly and we have to keep up to speed with it. Um, I've, um, I've put a new poll in and a couple of people already answered, just asking people's opinions of what, what NADP can provide for them. Uh, it, the last uh, poll, um, there was a, a, a really wide range of sort of favoured activities, uh, CPD kind of opportunities, a lot of them related to interactivity. Um, but a lot of people also really loving being able to engage in this kind of event online, not having to pay travel costs and it's free and that there are these opportunities have multiplied. And um, what about you guys? What are the things that you most like to engage? What are the things that make you most excited when it comes to CPD? Is it a course? Is it, Alison? I, I was just thinking about this actually, in, in, in relation to CPD being most meaningful to me, it's when it's actually relevant to something that I'm doing at the time. So if I've got a certain situation with a student and I'm looking into something, be it what, what, whatever it might be, if there's some CPD that comes up that is linked to that, if I've got like a real live case or situation that I can relate it to, that makes me much more engaged and focused on it. Because even if I'm really interested in a topic, I go along and do something, do, do some CPD. If I haven't got anything to, to kind of relate it to in the near future, a year or so later, I'll think, oh, there was something interesting there, but I can't remember what it was or try and find the information. So yeah, so my, my kind of main drive would be that it's something relevant at the time for me or for so the team. That, Alison, does that, does that mean that you go in search of CPD at the time you need it rather than doing it yeah, on or, a kind of regular Yeah, or basis. things come up. So we're talking about, um, somebody mentioned the, the new digital accessibility legislation that's, co that's come out recently. I've been supporting a, a totally blind student and she's had loads of issues with access to materials um, and took a year out and has come back and I've been supporting her in coming back. So like I volunteered to try out the mandatory digital accessibility course that Sheffield Hallam were writing for all staff to do. So I trialled that and gave feedback and then did it again when it came out and was really keen to do it as soon as possible and have been sending it on to relevant tutors and people that work with this student. And then it's developed into a larger project that I'm working on at the moment about changing support for visually impaired students on a much wider basis, just kind of updating stuff. As have we said, the critical analysis, the reflection, that digital accessibility change in legislation just made us rethink the service more generally. And because I was working with someone that made me think, right, I'm going to, I'll take this on and do more CPD around it. And then like I'm delivering training next week on it to the wider team, you know, so that they're, they're aware of what we're doing and can pass on the most useful, useful bits. And being able to teach something is one of the most um, learning full uh, activities you can actually mm. engage in anyway, isn't it? Mm. It's, it's, it's interesting. Oh, and in nice fact, yeah, doing the doing the training, preparing the training materials has made me review and review it again and, you know, and think about it. And we've changed it just from having to review it by that process. So, yeah, it's really, really helpful. Amy. Yeah, I think that notion of train the trainer type courses is really, really interesting, especially in large organisations, because, um, you know, a lot of the time you don't want to send everyone on a course as such, but you want that information to be disseminated through the team. And we've done some quite interesting accessibility champion style training um, in the last year or two, but for, for, again, in response to the regulations. And they, I think um, there's a different um, energy from delegates when they know they've come to learn something that they then need to uh, pass on to others. You know that sometimes you, you're a bit back in your seat when you're being uh, when you're being taught, but when you know that there's something that you need to do off the back of that, we got probably I'd say greater engagement, more curiosity, 
um, there was a lot of sort of personal stories in there, but trying to be able to take that emotive, uh, this is why this is important. And so I think I, I relish a train the trainer approach because then I think I'm less likely, because again, I think Honesty Club, uh, doing all this stuff online is very easy to get drawn into a notification or an email and and sort of let let some of the some of the topics slip whereas if you know that there's a, a follow-up activity and people are going to be relying on you to do a good job of communicating that learning that's quite powerful and always always the lived experience stories that's uh, I, I really appreciate being able to connect a you know a, a topic or a or a learning to the the live context so going back to what Alison said really it's that cementing isn't it yeah 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 for sure somebody said the question what development opportunities would you most like NADP to offer fun said somebody <laughs> but you know I get that <laughs> which which is great because actually, you know, you do tend to learn more if the experience is, is does have an element of fun in it. And um, in talking to students about what they like about lecturers, I've found that, you know, if the lecturer has an element of humour, a bit of fun about them, then uh, they tend to engage more overall with the sessions. But that's uh, that's perhaps a, an, another another topic for another time. Um. Uh, where have we got to? Um, yes, favourite CPD events of your past. What are the things that, that that marked out your, you know, your own learning? What are the things that stand out for you in terms of perhaps changes in direction, either that you that you took without realising you were going to make a big turn as a result, or you, at, you know, you knew you were making a big turn and so you had to engage with something. Anything in, in, in particular? I'll start. Uh, the, for, for, for me, while you're thinking, um, I, I, I was sort of half shoved by, uh, by my wife to go and attend a sign language course, BSL stage one. Um, it was a sort of week long thing and uh, I, I'd, I'd had no previous desire to get involved. And uh, from that moment on, I was hooked. And uh, obviously, I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for that, because prior to that, I was in nothing to do with anything in this sector whatsoever. Um, but it, it, it was such a powerful experience that it um, shifted me towards sign language interpreting and into higher education. And I think for me, that, that, that just that particular opportunity was probably one of the biggest changes in my whole life, just a, a one week long sign language course it can change your life without doubt well, what about others any any um any thoughts in that in that Shall way i say something really controversial i'll try i'll try not to be too controversial i promise but um i actually trained as a, a as a dyslexia tutor and i won't say where and i won't say i won't go into details but I think there was a bit of a growing indignation inside of it. I was motivated to do it because my, my daughter's dyslexic. And to me, having worked with people with dyslexia, it was fairly obvious from the age of about four or five that she was dyslexic. But obviously I'm dyspraxic myself. And, and I just remember just sitting there being really cross because this course was really about fixing people and rem remediating difficulties. And so this would be an example of where I guess CPD didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to, but actually it was, it was a massive motivator for me sitting through that um, and people not necessarily practicing what they preach. So um, driving quite a long length of the country to sit down and have someone read me a PowerPoint, which is just not how I learn. You know, you're mm. talking about humor and active learning. I think there's so much value in that. The humor thing I think is really important. I've actually looked into why that is and and it's because actually um humor seems to work when even when adrenaline levels are high which is quite interesting people think that it was um sort of you know when you've got a fight or flight response and you're running away from the tiger that people would laugh at the end of it to just let let, let each other know that it was safe and the threat had passed so 
quite often like I use humorous revision techniques. I'm not a natural comedian though. I use humorous um, revision techniques and things like that with students and things like that. Well, this course was the opposite of that. It was it was really dry. And they were talking about inclusive practice, but they weren't practicing it. Um, and it was all about fixing and remediating. And I just felt so cross about that. I just thought, do you know what? I need to find my voice because because this isn't the way the world should be. Um, and after that, I've just totally done everything that I can to look at inclusive curriculum design, inclusive learning, co-creation, um, co-development, empowering, affirmation model, all of that sort of stuff to just really put a twist on that, almost as an act of rebellion because this thing annoyed <laughs> me so much. <laughs> That's really interesting. And it, it, yeah, I mean, I think it's true. And it and it's reflects as well in lots of the um work i see from academics is the driving force for their own development and their own moves into education or whatever is very often a negative experience but nevertheless that negative experience is one that has a very very positive outcome because it it drives them to want to make change so that's quite interesting i'm just looking at the um at the slido again and we've got we've got people talking about what they want to see as being subject matter, as in, I want to see, you know, things around policy and process or technology. And we've got other people talking about um, the way in which they like, they would like to, to learn, as in, I want something really practical that I can then actually start putting into practice straight away, either in the session or so something about experiential learning almost. Um, what, what ways do you find that you learn best in a CPD context? Open question. I'm personally a bit of a learning by doing and <laughs> talking aloud and discussion. That, that, that's my, my personal preference. I, I don't, I don't go, I, I don't engage well with very sort of passive learning. Um, yeah, again, I, I would I would second that around practical um, where you can, you know, you, you listen for a bit, but then you can really dive into some exercises that are going to help you unpack what you've just heard and, and try and apply it straight away. Nikki? Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, something interactive is really, really helpful so that you're engaging with the learning in the way you describe but I, I do find it irritating if I turn up someone, we all get in a group and chat about something and then go home and it's a bit, it feels a bit half baked. What mm. I really like is being very, very clear about what, what we're discussing. And ideally, we've done something in advance so that it's bespoke to the situation. It makes a load of sense. And having some input, which has got some quite meaty content, which directs me to other sources, and, you know, that can be quite short and then getting into interactive activities, which are really related to uh, the practical outcome we're trying to achieve. So it's got to feel really purposeful. Otherwise, I feel like I'm sitting having a chat and wasting my time, honestly. What do people think about, because uh, this is something that we have battled with, because I, I, I often feel like before a group session, it's advantageous to do some prep and to do some background reading and to come along with some thoughts, especially for people who process more slowly and need to digest to be able to interact. But the biggest challenge with that is that the people, uh, only half the people do the pre-work. <laughs> Has anyone got a solution for that for me? <laughs> Sorry, I, AB, I shot my hand at then like I had a solution, if only. Um, I don't have a solution, but I, it sort of linked to that and to the other comments is I, I think because we are fairly aware that interaction is a good way to sort of um, show relevance and get engagement and stuff. I think sometimes there's a bit of a rush to that interaction mm. and then it can can be a bit aimless and a bit, you know, yeah. um, and and and. I have found increasingly so that little bit of extra time to process is is really appreciated. Um, and so I think that it's finding that balance between, and one way of doing that is giving people information in advance and some resources and some material to get them thinking, to get, um, get yourself thinking as well. But I think there's a balance as well about giving maybe 
some activity that is a bit more related to the the theory or the Mm. the kind of the meat of it rather than going straight for application because you haven't Mm. necessarily processed enough what you've what it is you're trying to grapple with and then all of a sudden you're being asked to apply it it's giving space to sort of make sure you have understood the thing you're there to understand I suppose um and I think that yeah that that would be maybe that is the answer Amy is that it won't matter then if you haven't read so much because you you do have yeah sorry that's okay I I I think I think those that's a really good point Chris and 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 I and I think that it's it isn't as much about giving people the time in the sessions themselves I ran some sessions it was NADP sessions actually and um you know we, we all say that we we you know like interactivity but interactivity requires people being bold enough to kind of stick their hand up and engage in, in, in what you're doing and if you split people up into groups which is you know part of what what makes a good interactive session you often find that the groups are dominated by one or two people speaking for the full 10 minutes and then you come back and i um i just thought it's time to give other people a chance so to give them a chance to process before they're listening to somebody else so i made it a rule that as they broke into the groups i had to spend five to ten minutes without speaking just jotting down their own thoughts and i was staggered by the amount of feedback i got from that session highlighting that as the particular thing that was the best thing about the session i thought that was mm-hmm. i was just quite staggered but i think it's really important because we rely on interactivity but that doesn't mean to say that those people who um prefer to think a bit more and process a bit more before they contribute their ideas don't have ideas or don't want to engage with the session and sometimes they just can't contribute because of that perhaps more introverted learners helen you you wanted to contribute Um, from the from the chat uh, yeah i was just going to flag it was rather than the pre um the pre-interaction and thinking it was more a comment from um, joanna in the chat about um the importance of connecting onward afterwards after cpd opportunities and learning to keep in touch with colleagues in a meaningful way and that that can be um more challenging and she's suggesting maybe um in terms of online teams connections now and being more confident with remote interactions maybe that's something that will be improved in the future do the just thought I'd flag it. Yeah, can I just come in on that comment as well? Because that idea of multidisciplinary teams working together, I think is incredibly important because everybody then brings all their different perspectives onto the same issue. You know, it's like we're all wearing our different hats and see things slightly differently, but often we only have an opportunity to interact in a CPD um, context with people who have exactly the same roles. And we've done a lot of um, autism focused training with NADP. And one of the ways that works best, I think, is when you've got an interdisciplinary group, you give them some very informed autism theory informed by autistic people briefly, and then a set of scenarios and say, why do you think this might happen? And there's no right answer. So nobody feels like they've got it wrong because there could be all sorts of reasons why, for example, somebody's not eating or something like that. So it's like bite size, input, then discussion, but around a sort of case study type vignette scenario um, made up people, obviously. That seems, to, that seems to engage people, I think, especially if they don't feel you're going to tell them that they've got it wrong, because that really shuts down the interaction immediately. Yeah, yeah. Are we comfortable with quietness? Um, I'll just t- turning to the to the polls again to see. And as I said before, a lot of active learning. Um, Opportun- development opportunities would you most like NADP to offer is what I asked. What do you think um, um, of this this conference change? Um, so, you know, this is the second year of an online conference. Um, the, the feedback we've had from mem- delegates generally appears to be really good. 
Um, what 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 are your opinions about? Okay, so let's assume next year, all all fears are banished. We're able to do whatever it is we we want. What um, what do you think would would work best from an NADP perspective in terms of delivering stuff? Any offers? Nikki? I think we need this as well rather than instead. I think this is absolutely brilliant. And I think it would be ideal if we could keep the momentum of this sort of conference going as far as resources enable this to happen. I think it's brilliant. But I really miss the proper face-to-face -face interaction that happens at conference. And if we could have both, that would be wonderful, I think. Quite a few organisations are looking at a blended conference format. Um, we do our Tech Share Pro conference in November every year, and I think this year it will be mostly online, but we are going to have like a studio with a small audience so that some people will be there. But I mean, when we used to do it in person it was fantastic and we'd have people coming in from all around the world but there was only so many people you could get in whereas last year we we had you know the the constraints of of the the team's platform that Microsoft had, had supplied but that was you know it was big much bigger than than we would ever have been able to do in person um the other thing I think that's quite interesting and we've done with our volunteer conference is to have um, a London, a Scotland and, and stream to one another. And, you know, you do have endless, <laughs> endless technical problems, which we've all experienced. But that way you do get to have the uh, everyone's together but not having to travel miles and as groups you can hit the pub afterwards or have a networking event or go bowling or whatever it is you need to do because actually the communities of practice what we've what we've missed out on going back to the fun then in the slido is the letting our hair down together at the end of the day and 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 all of those things which actually cement those groups to keep you together with people and 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 again the, the comment around teams but even whatsapp groups and things like that can just uh, keep that ball rolling but without the social element it's harder to come away feeling you've made friends you know you go into an online breakout group and then whoosh it's over and you never see them again i, I think um it, you know, we you can't deny the the convenience of the online um, and how helpful it is for people who would have difficulty traveling or wouldn't be able to get the time out. But but I think somebody said earlier about it's really hard in this environment, you know, to sort of not have one eye on emails and not have, you know, you're so distracted by other things. So I think as well as rather than instead of if you know resourcing allow possibly addressing some of the issues we we have at the end of day two for instance people do have to leave to 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 travel it you know could maybe make sure that offer of a two-day conference is a full two days if it's top and tailed with an online option yeah somebody's put in the chat in the in the slido here that one of the good things about online delivery is, you know, everybody can get involved and, and connect. And there's also less uh, uh, grouping. I think at conferences, there can be a tendency for, you know, old friends to coalesce mm -hmm. together and it can seem a bit cliquey <clears throat> perhaps. And then, um, you know, th there isn't really an opportunity or such a good opportunity whereas for, for meeting new people, whereas breakout rooms in, in something like Zoom kind of, randomly places people together and and um new new contacts are made what do you think of that that's really true because actually when you're the new person it can be quite um borderline terrifying walking into a conference environment where everyone seems to know each other and you don't know who to stand with whilst you have your cup of tea or coffee 
Um, so yeah, if you're talking inclusive practices, being able to access either in person or remotely, and maybe even having almost a, a, an online build up to a physical conference where you can make some connections and perhaps start to feed into some of the in-person uh, activities. And then, you know, perhaps some follow up online networking sessions where people, uh, there's some brilliant apps. I don't know if anyone, I haven't been to an Amoshi conference for a couple of years now, but I went to one a while back and they had an app where you could connect with other delegates. It's almost like a LinkedIn, but an event focused LinkedIn. You could link up and make friends with people and arrange to go and have a cup of tea with them or whatever, which was really, really nice because, you know, you could just go and say, oh, who's here? Oh, I've seen them on X or Y forum. I'll, I'll uh, you know, just uh, start the ball rolling. It's all these different ways that you can break the ice that we've got. Somebody's just put that we get to see some lovely pets online. That's really my business. Oh, <laughs> your dog earlier, Nikki. Gorgeous. I'm very well behaved. He's not mine, actually. Oh. But he is gorgeous. I do agree. <laughs> mm, huggable. Yeah, it is. It is let people bring their pets to conference. Maybe that would get around that one. <laughs> you could have the prettiest pooch competition, couldn't you? <laughs> Hungriest cats. N a um. NADP does crafts. <laughs> okay. Well, listen. I think we've just we've just reached the end of the line for this debate. If we're talking about <laughs> about pet competitions at conference, all right. So, I will compose myself. It's, it's 20 past. I know there's uh, some final comments that, uh, that Caroline wants to make um, in terms of the conference itself and from the broader NADP perspective. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, the panellists one last opportunity to um, either sum up or give us a, a little story about their own professional development or and anything at all, really, just to, to sum up and say goodbye. And thank you very much for your contributions generally anyway so uh, does anyone want to kick off with any final comments any final thoughts no you've got no final thoughts who wants Go to on then. I'll, 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 I'll say something about the accreditation scheme because oh, yeah. going back to what i was saying earlier about just um having very mixed experiences of cpd and also um sort of cpd binging which wasn't terribly helpful um accreditation frameworks i think are really useful so i've just gone through the nidp um senior member membership um accreditation and i have to say i know i'm biased because i'm a director but i have to say it was it was great it's been structured in a way that i could do it little by little rather than having to do huge chunks of work you know after work when I'm tired which is great and I just think that um to develop your career and also to work effectively with your colleagues in a department something that helps you to structure your CPD in that way is really useful all oh, right nice one thank you Fiona yeah, my colleagues who've gone through the accreditation process really got a lot from it, actually. Definitely, really well thought out. Um, and actually, I, I came to a session with you, Paddy. I don't know if that's the one you were alluding to for NADP, which was putting the accreditation process together. And you did exactly that, where you had us all write down our own thoughts beforehand. And it was a, a perfect moment of silence whilst everyone ha had a think. So... Yeah, that was a very, it was a very collaborative process to build the accreditation process and then the pilots, which um, my colleague Teresa sat in on and then some more of the team have gone through it. So I would massively recommend it to others. Good, good news. Can I just say that, that it's good, sorry. About okay. the accreditation, it's just how we get the sector to think it's as important as it actually is, because it seems to me to be the main opportunity for structured CPD leading to a recognised form of accreditation for people in our, in our sort of roles. And I just wonder whether we should be making sure that the um, Commission for Disabled Students and Office for Students and everybody else understands the value of the accreditation. Because when we first started, we were looking at 
hoping it will get onto people onto job descriptions and you know person specs for jobs and things and an awful lot of work has gone into it over many many years and it's theorized practical insider perspective informed current relevant it's actually brilliant but it's not widely known enough and I don't know if there's any advice here on what we could do about that do you think the office for students would pick it up a bit I think a lot a lot of energy sort of comes out of you know the access and participation plans and so on and whether it could be is it TASO as well the what works and all that kind of stuff it, it's almost like it just needs to pop up in more places doesn't it you know it yeah. needs yeah it's, and it's I think the board the board can't do it because as as the directors have created it I think if we flag it we look like we're advertising it I shouldn't say we because I'm an advisor not a director but I think if our membership really yeah really really sort of waved this about and said look at this brilliant opportunity because it's also very inexpensive in comparison with for example doing a postgraduate diploma at a university which I know costs a fortune for example. Could you collect some case studies I mean we you know we'd be happy to sort of publish some blogs in things with case studies things I do think it's that is that and we'd feed into that as well to be honest that if we could get some more views with different practitioners in different roles because I think that's what it is it's about yeah. it it becoming a commonly known you know it, it's yeah. a bit of a well-kept secret at the moment isn't it and um and I do think there are you know DFE would also be a place to go they do have some sort of impact on the what works type you know advocating these things so um yeah, one, one to chew over. Maybe we should have a brainstorming session with some of the graduates from the scheme to say, how can we retell the story and how it's benefited? Yeah, that's that's really thoughtful, yeah. actually. I, I will definitely take that back to the accreditation committee and um, and uh, look, look at those ideas. We have been making... Um, progress with the disabled students commission in terms of their yeah. engagement great with, um great. over the scheme um and hopefully that in itself will have a little bit of a an additional um what's the word i don't know yeah. raise pro profile raising yeah. but um but you're you're right i think we we do need to do more on that front and we we we've made some initial contact with amoshi as well around it so um I think they'd be a key organisation. They are a key well, organisation. They'll be the approvers of the budget, won't they? That's the thing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, listen, guys, thank you very much. We did manage to fill our allotted slot. Uh, and I really appreciate your time and contributions. I found it really interesting. I hope um, the delegates have as well. Uh, and um, thank you to the delegates too for all the contributions to the Slidos. Um, those I'm going to definitely make sure get collected and passed to the conference committee because I think there's some really useful stuff in the CBD, CPD committee because I think there'll be some useful stuff in there from, from our members, our most important folk. Um, and uh, thanks also obviously to Caroline and to Lynn and to um, Joan Rose and the uh, uh, team at the office for all their support for these events and to Helen as chair of the uh, conference committee. Thank you so much all. And I hand back now to uh, Caroline, I think, to sort of finalise and round off the whole event. So thank you very much, everyone. Yep. Can I just check whether you can hear me? Because I keep yeah. dropping. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. can. Great and see me. Um, so yeah, just finally to say thank you to everybody who's attended today and it's been um, it's been really great. Thank you Paddy uh, very much for putting this panel together and to um, Alison, Amy, Chris and Fiona and Nikki for um, a brilliant discussion and I've been uh, chairing the CPD committee for NADP for the last year or so and um, so it is it will give us lots of things to think about as we gather together your views from the um, Slido so thank you to everybody who um, put the, 
that across. I think Paddy said thanks to everybody, but thank you again to um, Lynn, Joe and Rose from the office and to Helen and um, to all of you who've attended all the conference uh, events this month. Uh, all five events and the uh, videos and content as well as what has actually uh, gone on but there's been there's lots of other supplementary videos um, and content as well from each uh, session this month are, will all be up on the website as we go forward as will the awards video and um, and and uh, other lots of other content as well um, if you didn't know for example about accreditation before there's um, plenty of information uh, about that as well and how you can uh, get accredited um, so yes thank you to um, everybody and see you soon and <laughs> as a new chair of NADP um, um, it's, it's great Great to be here and doing that and uh, I will see you all soon. Thank you very much.